In 2005, Hank Rogers was already a multimillionaire legend in the video game industry. Then at age 53, he had a near-death experience, which was a game changer for him. Here's Hank's amazing story in his own words. My first job out of high school was moving furniture, and I went back much later and visited my partner back, you know, back when. 20 years later, he said, you know, Hank, in all this time, I never met anyone who could pack a truck like you. And that was like one of the best compliments ever, I thought. And then I uh, came to Hawaii, and I did odd jobs. I worked at a, a jewelry store because my dad was in the gem business. And while I was at UH, so I worked my way through school. So I, boy, I, I had a job cleaning the grease traps in, in restaurants at night, which is probably the nastiest job I ever had. You know, I did construction. Uh, but the, the job I enjoyed the most, I guess, was uh, driving taxi. I used to drive Charlie's taxi back in, uh, gosh, must be 75. And you never know who's going to step into your cab, so it's always an adventure every time. And if you're just a little open to having a conversation, so I, you know, you could say that I, I learned how to talk to people by talking to all kinds of strangers in, in, uh, in my cab. I studied computer science at University of Hawaii, and uh, we used to play Dungeons and Dragons. And uh, gosh, six years later, I found myself in Japan. Uh, personal computers just came out and uh, games were coming out in cassette tape. They were starting to and I thought I can do that because I knew how to program and how to make D&D uh, &D, I guess. And so I made the first role-playing game in Japan in 1983. It launched not only my career but it launched my first publishing business. Um, there were no other role-playing games so we were like, we were like gr breaking ground. Now 30% of all games in Japan are, are role-playing games. In 1989, I went to Moscow to get the Game Boy rights to Tetris, and I was dealing with the Ministry of Software. And in my first meeting, lo and behold, there was Alexei Pajdanov, the actual creator of Tetris. And uh, we hit it off, I mean, immediately. I'm a game designer, he's a game designer, we could talk. Everybody in, else in the room didn't know what we were talking about. And he kind of used the Ministry to get his game outside of uh, the Soviet Union and I kind of used the ministry to be the other end of that. So I was the first business, I was the first reasonable businessman he ever met. We are still friends today. I mean, I built that relationship. I, and and I, eventually I brought him to the States, got him his green card, and now he's an American citizen. The relationship is really important. Uh, it's, it's much more important than any of the contracts that I have with him. And I believe that's the way it is. That's the way it should be. Is your relationship with someone uh, is number one, and the contract is sort of an attempt at writing down what your feeling is about that person. So Tetris has sort of been the anomaly in the game business in that it's still going strong after all these years. It's still going strong today. It's the big. It's probably the biggest game on uh, mobile phones. We've passed 200 million copies on mobile phones. So you you know people think Tetris Game Boy, but no Tetris mobile phone. In the spring of 2005, I sold one of my publishing companies. I basically hit one out of the park. A month later, I, I'm at Wildlife Country Club playing tennis, and after the game, I didn't feel well. Uh, obviously, my EKG went nuts, and I was having a full-fledged heart attack in the ambulance. 100% blockage of the Widowmaker. That's the largest artery in your heart. Um, in that ambulance, I made up my mind. I said, uh, I'm not ready to go, I still have stuff to do. I'd pretty much done all the, all the things that I'd business-wise set out to do when I started on my business career. So I didn't have anything else to do there, and then I thought, okay, so what is going to upset me the most if I haven't done anything about it when I actually die, whenever that is? In the bucket list, I came up with my four missions in life. So my first uh, mission is to end the use of carbon-based fuel. We can't afford it. We, we should find our own indigenous, indigenous renewable energy and use that instead. But I, I didn't feel that, I didn't feel comfortable trying to talk to the rest of the world before I'd cleaned my own room. And Hawaii is my own room. It's our own room. And so Blue Planet Foundation has been, for the last six years, been totally focused on, on moving the ball in Hawaii significantly. If the tanker stops coming to Hawaii, we have 26 days of fuel left in Hawaii. So, I mean, that is a sobering thought. I believe that Hawaii can be energy independent. We have no, we have 
all the wind we could possibly want. We have all the solar we could possibly want. We have the ability to do OTEC, ocean thermal energy conversion, and we have geothermal. I mean, these, these are like amazing resources and we're just completely underutilizing them. And why? It's because people don't really understand that the da they don't understand the damage that we're doing with the oil. Economically, uh, environmentally, you know, every, every way, which way you look, we've been burning things since cavemen and it's time to stop because we have other ways of getting our energy. Mission number two is to end war. We never had a clear goal as to what we're supposed to achieve. But war in general is just a waste of money. We spend trillions of dollars. The reason that we have all, having all this economic problem is because of war and just no, no use for it. Number three is to uh, make a backup of life on Earth. And uh, that's a big one. Um, arguably the most interesting thing that ever happened on this planet is life. And you could think that it's uh, spontaneous generation, which means it came from nothing, panspermia, panspermi which means it came from outer space, or divine intervention, which means God did it. It doesn't matter. It's still the most amazing thing that ever happened on this planet. And I'm, uh, I'm a director now of uh, PISCES, the Pacific International Space Center for Exploration Systems. We are looking to have space exploration to be a very important industry in Hawaii in the future. Uh, we are looking to have people study living on Mars by living on Mauna Loa, Mauna Kea uh, sustainably. Because you, when you go to Mars, you have to bring everything. You're not going to find anything there. It's all, you've got to bring everything with you. And if you're going to have food, you have to grow it. Pisces covers such things as making, a, making a, a moon base called the International Lunar Research Park. It covers uh, space tourism, like Richard Branson's uh, Virgin Galactic. I've, w I've gone and talked to him about that. What can we do to make Virgin Galactic come to Hawaii and launch from Hawaii? And the answer is, have an airport like that. That's it. It doesn't require anything else except a 10,000 foot runway. So the first time, the reason I got involved with, uh, with Pisces is I was invited to watch a little robot competition, not a competition. They were doing a robotic thing on Mauna Kea. And they had robots from Canada, from Germany, from the mainland, from any place but here. And I'm, I, I, I'm looking at all these robots and they're all doing whatever, moving on Mars, because that's what it's supposed to be. And I said, where's the Hawaii robot? He said, well, we don't have a ro Hawaii robot. And I said, what is wrong with you people? Do you know, do you have any idea how excited the kids in Hawaii are about robotics and you don't even give them a chance to have a robot on Mauna Kea? Uh, I, was, I was pretty angry. We don't want our kids to have to go somewhere else to work in the robotics field. We want to have those jobs here. So we should be studying space exploration. We should have the rover happening here. We've got the terrain that's closest to Mars. What are we doing? The, the Polynesians came to Hawaii and not only did they come to Hawaii, they knew how to go back. Any idea how far that is? That's thousands of miles and they had the technology to know exactly where they were and how to get back to where they came from. And now we've pretty much Polynesia has covered the Pacific. But we as, uh, as, a, as the human race, we've covered every place on, on this planet. It's time for us to go there. The fourth one is to find out how the universe ends and do something about it. If, by the way, we figure out how the universe ends, I think we'll find out something very fundamental about physics and the universe that we don't understand now. Don't touch that game controller. We have more coming up about blue startups, part of Hank's ever-expanding blue planet family.